In the ghetto, there is a mansion. It is my father's house. It sits on seven acres, surrounded by growling row homes. Frozen in architectural class war, its expansive lawn is utterly useless, wild like it smokes its own grass and dreams of being a jungle. The street around it is even worse. Littered with the disposables no one could bother to put in the can, the cars on their last American owner, the living dead roaming slow and steady to nowhere. And this damn house, which killed my father, is as big as it is old. Decaying to gray pulp, yet somehow still standing there with its phallic white pillars and the intention of eternity. An 18th century estate in the middle of the urban depression of Germantown. Before he died, my father bought the wreck at auction, planned on restoring it to its original state, just like he did for so many smaller houses in the neighborhood, rescuing a slice of colonial history to sell it back to the city for a timeless American profit. His plan didn't include being old, getting sick, or me having to come back to this country, to this city, to pick up his pieces. This house is a job for a legion, not one person. It will kill one person. It did, my father. I am one person now. My father's house is on me. I see it from the back of the cab up on its hill, rotting. Donated by the Loudon family after the Depression, the mansion was used by the city as a museum until a fire that created repair costs beyond its means and interests. At one point in my life, decades before, I was a boy. As such, I knew this house. I used to ride the 23 trolley past its absurd presence and marvel at this artifact of rich white folks' attempted dynasty, a physical memory of historic Germantown's pastoral roots before the largest city of Philadelphia exploded past this location, propelled by the force of the Industrial Revolution. Most things from childhood get smaller with age, but loud to mention towers, because now I gotta take care of it. So I want to run. I sit passively in the taxi as I'm driven closer, but my thighs ache and my bowels are prepared to evacuate, then I want to open the door and run. I'll run, I'll run through North Philly if I have to, all the way downtown, run along the highway back to the airport, then run again away from the whole damn country. The white cab driver makes no move to get out with me when he finally stops, just pops the trunk open with one button and with another relocks the doors after I open mine. That lock clicks hard. I'm on the street with my bags and I can't get back outside. I'm not white, but I can feel the eyes of the few people outside on me. People who must think I am because I look white and as such, what the hell am I doing here? This disconnect in my racial projection, it's one of the things I hate. It goes in a subcategory I call America, which has another subheading called Philly. I hate that because I know I'm black. My mother was black. That counts, no matter how pale and Irish my father was. So I shall not be rebuked. I will not be rejected. I want to run off, but I refuse to be run off. A kid walks by, about 17, not much younger than I was when I escaped this neighborhood. He looks up, and as I lift my bags, I give him the appropriate local response, an expression that says, I'm having a bad life in general and a headache right now. Welcome home. There are blocks around here where you can be attacked for looking another man in the eyes, and other blocks where you can be assaulted for not giving the respect of eye contact. I could never figure it, which blocks was which until I realized these were just the excuses of sociopaths. The sociopaths, that's the real problem. The whole street demeanor is about pretending to be a sociopath as well, so the real ones can't find you. When I get to the porch, the front door opens. I can hear it creak before I see someone emerging from behind its paint cracked surface. Sir Leaf Day is carpeted in cloth. He's got a Kenyan dashiki, Sudanese mud cloth pants, a little Ghanaian kente hat. It's like Africa finally united, but just in his wardrobe. <laughs> Last time I saw him, he dressed the same, but he only had one leather medallion. Now he has enough to be the most decorated general in the Afrocentric army. I give him a how you doing and the Philly salute, a hummingbird-like vibration of my forehead, the most offensive of nods. He gives me a hug. He hugs me like he knows I'm trying to get away. 
So you had your first divorce. That just means you're a man now. Which kind was it? She stopped loving you or you stopped loving her? It wasn't like that, I tell him. Sir Leaf grips me closer. Oh, hell no. I hope it wasn't one of those where you both still love each other, but it's broke anyway. Those are the worst. My first, fourth marriages, they were like that. At least you didn't have any kids with her. Uncle Sir Leaf, I really don't want to talk about it. Don't give me that Uncle Mess. You're too old for that shit. And I'm way too young, he says, pushing me back for another look before pulling me in once more. Your pop was waiting for you to come home. You know that? This house, it was going to be for you. You and your wife, your children. Bring you back to the community. Sir Lee's voice cracks with emotion. It makes me feel guilty for wanting to break free of his musky grasp. And it did. You got to get that crazy old honky that. I look over Sir Lee's shoulder. There's a rusty Folgers can sitting on the porch by the wall. It's there because my dad never smoked in the house. This can of ashes is full of cheap cigar butts mixed with cigarette butts of whoever visited. I know without looking inside it because there was always a can like that on the porch or wherever my dad was living. He knew I wasn't coming back. He was just going to fix it up to sell like he always did. This gets him to release me, partially. He still holds my shoulders, pushing me back as far as he can to take a look at my face. Was it his fault you ran off, was it? My daddy left me when I was four and gave me nothing but my stunning Yoruba features, so stop bitching. Sir Leaf is a lawyer, a realtor, a griot, and a kook, and he's good at all those things. My dad was his white friend because they had the kook thing in common. For three decades, they would get together to sell a property or drink whiskey and get kooky together. My dad had his own realtor's license, but he wasn't good with most types of humans. Sir Leaf is the people's man, knows everyone that matters in Germantown, from councilmen to people looking to buy their first homes. He speaks three languages, street, Caucasian, and brother man. Sir Leaf's getting old, and he finally looks it. Some people age, and some just dehydrate. Sir Leaf looks like someone let the water out and the crease is dried in its absence. I can't imagine how old my dad must have looked. They were the same age, but my father was one of those pasty Irish people with no melanin to protect their skin from time. He could barely manage enough pigment for a mole. We should really have a funeral, I tell him, or a memorial, or he ain't want one. And we're going to respect that. You know your pop. He wasn't one to spend good money on a bunch of bullshit. His legacy, it's this house, this property, and it's you. Now let's look at your inheritance. With great flourish, Sir Leaf turns back to open the front door, but it's stuck. The woods swell, and it takes a lot to jar, a lot of effort to protect so little. Hell's lobby waits on the other side. If my father's soul is left in the physical world, it's in the tools he left behind, sandpaper, ladders, scaffolding, plaster and tarps, rollers and paint tins. At the back of my nose, I can smell the old spice and prowl even though he hadn't used either since I was 11. I will be buried here too. I just know. And then I fight that thought with the words I've been thinking in the days leading up to this moment. Paint and polish. Paint it. Polish the wood floors. Tidy up whatever basic visual problems might get in the way of a buyer's imagination. Build on whatever my father managed in the months since he's taken ownership. Use all the tricks he taught me. That's what I thought. Packing to come home stateside. That's what I thought. Waiting for the plane. That's what I tell myself now. Paint and polish. I even say it out loud. There ain't no roof, Sir Leaf says back to me. Go on, take a look at that joint. That's just crazy. The wiring in here is like 70 years old and exposed. I've seen that old fuse box in the back pop sparks twice in the last hour. It's a miracle he didn't burn the place down running his power tools. I don't know how your pops lived up in this mess. Craig was one cheap bastard, no offense. And he wags his head at the shame of it. I don't remind him about a childhood camped out in many a shelled home. My dad had been doing the same thing since my mother kicked him out, and that was 27 years ago. I don't tell him about pissing in paint buckets and dumping it out the window. You sure you want to sleep here? I mean, what about Tasha's? They still in that house I sold them. Six bedrooms, maybe you can stay there. I'll stop by, but I doubt her husband wants me under the same roof for an extended period. Up to you, but I'm out of here. This place creeps me out. You better see what you're dealing with on the second floor before it gets dark. Power's iffy up there. He points to the stairs. I get the message that he wants me to go up. I also get the message that he's afraid to, that at least he understands the limits of his age. As he leaves, 
Sturleaf stares at his feet with every step as if he's worried the old beams might give out on him. How soon can he get enlisted? I ask. He sighs. I've missed something. I told you, you can't sell the place the way it is, not without taking a huge loss. You can't sell it for the land. It's historic, so you got to get permission to build on it. You're going to have to pick up where your pop left off, and it's going to take a while to get it together, at least the basics. you got shoes to fill, boy, he tells me. And I just happen to look down when Sir Leaf says it. His shoes have at least two inches of heels on them. He catches me staring and says, I'm engaged in this new joint, young sister. She likes me tall. <laughs> Sir Leaf is right. There is no roof. There are walls. It has floors. Just no real top. In my book, that barely qualifies it as a house, makes it more of a massive cup. I brave the stairs, shining a flashlight above me as I pace the hall of the second story. In most parts of the ceiling, there's nothing but blue tarp separating the interior from the elements. There were a few charcoal beams in those rooms where my father had knocked the remains of the fire damage down. In the master bedroom, there's a green canvas tent, the old Coleman tent my dad used when he took me on trips to the Pine Barrens and the Appalachian Trail. Ghosts. Now its yellow plastic spikes are nailed directly into the blackened, fire-ravaged hardboard. Instead of camping out in the room of the house that's least damaged, as I would have done, as any normal person would have done, my father took up residence in a room that looks like a hollowed out piece of charcoal. There's a tarp on the floor to match the one glimpse through the burnt shingles above, but besides that, the space is nearly unprotected to the heavens. It's the 19th of August, about 80 degrees outside, 90 in this room. The windows up here are covered with brown paper taped to the glass, but the sun's heat gets in anyway. This is the place he grew sick in. Decided not to go to the doctor in. Then died in, quietly, of pneumonia. I always assumed he would die on the streets of Germantown itself, loud. Knocked over the head for being the wrong race, in the wrong neighborhood, in the wrong century. In the gloom, I drag everything, the fold-out table and chair, the lamp connected to the car battery, the propane grill, the five-gallon jugs of water, and eventually the tent itself, one by one downstairs to the dining hall, the least damaged room in the whole house. My father managed new drywall in there, matched to replace sections of the crown molding. Had gotten as far as laying out cans of primer for painting. With the sliding doors to the hall closed, the room seemed almost habitable. I tried to narrow my mind to the pragmatic nature of my next steps. I am exhausted and jet lagged and need to set up camp. Tomorrow, for spending money, I will go draw cartoons at a convention. And all this lets me ignore that I am deconstructing the scene of my father's death and lying down in it. I hear a sound and I'm awake and it happens so fast that I don't know if I've dreamt it. I'm not married anymore. There's no Bex in the bed next to me to ask if she heard something too. No Becky who knows what to do because she's smarter than me and I can resent that truth and still depend on it at the same time. No Bex because I never grew up or wanted what grown folks want and that's my fault and I can accept that. No Becky with her sallow Welsh flesh glowing in the moonlight, an image I love because its contrast made my own pale flesh seem sable in comparison. I sink into the despair at that, at the reminder of my failure to meet the needs of the one person I was legally sworn to love. And even though it's been almost 13 months, now I feel how alone I am. Then I hear the sound again, and suddenly all I feel is fear once more. It could be the settling of the house, the symphony of old wood doing its opening night performances. There are no sounds of cars outside to hide acoustics. Another sound, I think. I don't know. So I stopped breathing. When I was a kid, I would lie in bed at night till my fear of an exploding bladder was greater than my fear of the ghost I was sure I would see on the way to the can. I remained still in my bed for a minute more before my fear congeals into self-consciousness. I am a grown man scared of the dark. I get up to take a piss. My feet are so loud on the creaking planks that it reminds me that real objects make real sounds, not negotiable ones. Around me there are shadows, and there may even be ghosts too, but I am old enough to refuse to see them. 
in the bathroom. My urine hits the water in the bowl, and I look out the window into the gray of the night, the mist hovering over the grass, and then I see him. He's sitting on the tall grass, in the dark, all alone, his legs folded under him, just sitting there. My stream runs its course, but I still stand there. I can't move. I look at him, bald, black, ageless, clothes without distinction in the gloom, in the middle of the massive lawn between this mansion and the street, and I become as frozen as he is. I don't move because I'm too scared to. Even though I don't know why, even though he's not moving, he doesn't seem to be looking at me, or at least his head isn't facing my exact duration, it's facing the front door. I think he's a ghost. I know he's a ghost. He stays there. A minute passes and he stays there. Maybe not a ghost. Ghosts come in and out, dissipate, are insubstantial by nature. So it's a man. And when I move to pull away from the window, his head snaps up and he stares at me. Shooting down to a squat, I stay low till my legs begin to hope. There's no phone. I have no phone, not in this country, not in this house. I cannot call anyone even if I wanted to. No becks. My father is dead. I am alone. My breath, it's so loud, and I try opening my mouth wider just to get the sound to stop taunting me. I am a big guy. Six foot four, weigh 225 naked, and I decide to act like I am a big man, and I shoot upright, head for the room where my father's work materials are in, go to grab the biggest thing I can find. This turns out to be a long wooden spear, an extension for a foam paint roller. I hold it with two hands. I am an African warrior who looks like a Celtic one. I grip it so hard, my hands become even more white, adrenaline having replaced my blood, and then I go to the window. I want him to see me. I want him to see my size, my determination, my intent, my lance. I look out the window, and he's gone. And for a second, I'm even more scared. I want to be relieved, but now I'm incapable of it. Rod in hand, I check the other windows. I see nothing. I go upstairs for a better view, but no change. Germantown Avenue past the fence is without life. I stare out for minutes, then more. Occasionally, a car drives past along the chip cobblestones, but otherwise, it's empty. Too late to come home and too early to drive out, which puts it around 4 AM. I stand there on the second floor in the burnt out room of my father's. He chose it because it has the best view of the lawn, I realize. And when, many minutes later, I grow more tired than scared, I head back downstairs to lie down. Tomorrow, which is today, I will go sit at a table in a large crowded room and smile at strangers, drawing pictures of their heads on muscle-bound bodies covered in leotards, and they will pay me cash. It is so absurd, I laugh a little in my head, and I need that to get into my tent again, slide myself into my sleeping bag. Fear that, I remind myself. Fear social failure, you're better at it. I saw a crackhead in the night in Germantown. This hardly qualifies as a supernatural experience. I chuckle a bit and go to zip up the tent, and then I see the person standing by my door. She's a woman. She's not looking at me, she's looking up the stairs. My breath gets heavy again, but she keeps looking up there, not over at me, and she's a ghost, not the dead kind. She's clothed in dirty gown, the lingerie of a drug-addled seductress. She's a white woman, gaunt cheeks like bones around the dark hollows of her eye sockets. If she looks at me, I will pee myself. I will shit myself on this very floor, and I will scream too. I don't care what she wants. I just don't want her to turn her head and look at me. She coughs. It keeps going, phlegm rising from behind her toenails with each convulsion till it gets to the back of her throat and jumps into her hand. It echoes through the house. It is more here than I am. There's a splatter and then she's gone. When I hear the front door click behind her, I pull myself frantically from my bag and out of my tent and grab my spear and head for her. I am rage. I am anger. All the fear has been recycled. But I am caution too. And when I reach the door, I think there might be a pack of them out on the porch. The monsters, the rags falling from their skin, prepared to ambush me. So I let go of the handle. I am back in Philly. Landing in an airport doesn't count. Sitting in a taxi can be done anywhere. This feeling, this is Philly. 
They want something from me. They must, so they wouldn't be here. Do they think I'm white out of my element, vulnerable? They want something, and I have nothing. I am a man who has nothing at all, all this time meandering through life, yet all I have is wounds. I have no treasure, and I never want to know what they take from me instead. There is a tattered curtain over the entryway's left window, and I pull it aside, and the glass is revealed, is hand-blown and old and distorted, but I see movement, and I see them. I see the figures, a man and a woman, staring at the house, standing on the lawn, walking, walking backward, staring at the house, walking backward, away from me, until they reach the fence to the street and float up and over. I keep staring and waiting for more, but there's nothing there. I keep staring, though, until my breath calms down, but nothing happens out there. When I turn around, I look at the shadows in this home. I look at the buckling floors. I look at the cracks in all the walls, the evidence of a foundation crumbling beneath us. I smell the char of the fire, the sweet reek of mold, the insult of mouse urine. I see a million things that have to be fixed, restored, corrected, each one impossible, and each task mandatory for me to escape again. I see Sisyphus. This is bolder, just with doors and beams. I can't take it. So I look out of the window once more, where nothing is coming to get me because the neighborhood doesn't need to, because it knows I'm trapped and has all the time in the world. Then I look back into this house, and that's when I decide I'm going to burn the fucker down. Thank you.